we're going to jump into a pretty complex topic that a lot of people have a hard time understanding really what's going on. It's degrees of freedom. So I'm going to reset up this mate controller motion analysis study that we saw uh, on one of the earlier videos. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on motion analysis. And I'm going to solve it one time. And we're going to take a look at what's going on in this study. And it's, it's going to create a lot of problems for people. And not everybody necessarily understands exactly what those problems are, what they're caused by, or how to fix them very well. And what I'm talking about specifically is these mate redundancies. Best way I can describe it is if you take a, a concentric mate and then a coincident mate, the concentric mate restricts four degrees of freedom, the coincident restricts three, that gives you seven degrees of freedom restricted, but you still have a rotation left. Well, there's only six total degrees of freedom, so there's some redundancies in there. And so what happens is, if you right-click on your mates folder here in the, in the tree and go to degrees of freedom, you can take a look at the degree of freedom counter. So for every part, there's 21 parts in this one. For every part you have, there are six degrees of freedom. And then you've got cylindrical joints, planar joints, fixed joints, rotational motion. Each one of those is going to kind of give you an additional degree of freedom. But unfortunately, a lot of those end up being redundant. And so what the solver does is it tries to guess at which mates are redundant. And it just sort of throws them out. Now, that's kind of scary, because look at this. It actually threw out the lock mates. Now, in addition to throwing out mate uh, components that aren't needed, like for example, in this concentric, you know, you can't rotate out of a concentric, out of plane. So rotation X and Y about a concentric mate, that's kind of to be expected. You can't move in those directions. And restricting those are probably, you know, removing those restrictions are probably okay because the coincident that it goes along with is going to handle that no problem. In addition to that, though, you do have some mate types that just literally don't get solved. So in this case, and I already deleted it earlier, there was a profile center mate that I replaced with a concentric and a coincident mate. The profile center mate failed to work. My personal advice, my personal mantra, is to stay away from the advanced mates as much as possible with respect to things like width, limit distance, um, uh, profile center, uh, things like that. And the main reason being that they just don't they're not simple to solve and they don't end up working perfectly and so I'd prefer to just stay away from them completely. Sometimes it'll be obvious that it didn't solve, other times it's not going to be as obvious so anything you can do to eliminate those or to remove those would be best. Now I replaced this with concentric and coincident and I ended up with 47 redundancies. Now what I could have done instead if I delete those, I could have added it as a hinge mate. So if you've ever gone into the mechanical and you found this hinge mate, the hinge mate is just a coincident and a concentric at the same time in one mate dialog. But it's literally made for motion analysis because it gives you the same end result with no redundancies on your mate. So with that hinge in there, I'll go ahead and recalculate, and I'm going to expect, instead of 47 degrees of freedom, or, yeah, uh, redundant degrees of freedom, expect maybe we'll see something closer to 45. And so those two redundancies were removed by using a hinge mate. To give you a really simple summary here, the redundancies in your study are going to be extremely difficult to remove. Um, in our motion training class, we do have lessons where we specifically try to create a study that has zero redundancies, and it's really complicated. It ends up taking a lot of time, and it's nice if you're trying to do a purely theoretical study 
but in a lot of cases, you're just not going to get rid of those redundancies. However, indication of a poorly mated assembly would be a extremely high number of redundancies. This assembly has already been slimmed down as much as it possibly can for as complex as it is, and we still have 45 redundancies. If your assembly has 500 redundancies, you're probably not slimmed down nearly enough to what you need it to be. That doesn't mean you need to get it down to zero. It doesn't mean that 500 is a disqualifying number of redundancies, but you do need to be aware that that is a bit of an indication of where you're at. It also is an indication of how much simplification you've done. So create rigid body groups, or simplify your model, or get rid of unnecessary components as much as possible to keep that to a reasonable level. Otherwise, you may have some problems with solving at all, and especially with the actual results you get, which we'll see in this next bit. So let's explore an example where the redundancies are going to cause a serious problem and not just in terms of the, whether it solves or fails, whether things fly off or whether things fail to move at all. This is where your results are going to be potentially inaccurate. So I'm going to build a little chain here. And basically, there's a pin that goes all the way through this. So this part and this part are concentric. But so are this piece and this piece. And so what we've got to deal with is the fact that there's actually redundancies in the real world that need to be accounted for in our analysis. So let me do this one more time. We'll do concentrics there. And then we'll come over here and we'll do concentrics here. And so we now have uh, four concentric mates in what is effectively two concentric areas. So let's create a motion study. We'll do this as a motion analysis. And we're going to apply a force. We're just going to pull down on this with 10 pounds. Constant force. Nothing too fancy, right? So when we calculate, it doesn't move because we're just pulling it. Nothing too crazy there. We do have 12 redundancies. And if we look at those redundancies, you'll see that there's a lot of the rotations are what got removed. Nothing really about translations. Now what I want to do, though, is I want to take a look at this concentric mate. And I want to specifically know how much force was being held by this mate. Now because it's 10 pounds total, each one of these pins the central pin is holding 10, but each side should be holding 5, all things being equal. So if I come in and I measure this thing and I say I want to know what the force, this would be a reaction force, in the Y component of concentric 1. I'll click OK. Now it gives me an error. This is what we're actually discussing, this redundant constraints leading to invalid forces. It's asking if we want to change to bushings. I'm going to say no because I want to take you to bushings here in a second. But the total force is negative 5 pounds. That's basically what we expect, right? If I do it again and I say... force, reaction force in the Y component of concentric 2. We'll go ahead and add it to that existing plot. They're both at 5. Now, that's not supposed to happen. What's actually supposed to happen is that you get one of them carrying 10 and one of them carrying 0. But the solver always tends to surprise me with the way that it can handle certain things. I'm going to take one more stab at making this give us bad results. I'm going to put in a side load here. Uh, this one will be five pounds. And what I'm expecting this will do 
is now we're going to get some of these linkages are going to be higher than others or some are lower than others or we've got some torque that we need to take into account. So what we've got is one of them is now set at a reaction force of 5 pounds. The other one is set at negative 15, which means they both picked up 10 pounds in each direction. And so we're getting accurate forces on this assembly even though we're using what's effectively a, a flawed model and a flawed approach and the, the solvers even thrown up messages and saying these redundancies are being thrown out this is going to give you bad results and it still ends up working okay that tends to give people some confidence to say well it worked once you know on a similar model why didn't it work here what most likely is going to happen especially with more complex assemblies is one of these mates is going to carry all the weight the other one is going to be completely zeroed out. So be very aware of that scenario. So the way you would do this is you would uh, replace any redundant mates with bushings. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can do it one at a time or you can just kind of shotgun approach it and just say replace all redundant mates with bushings. This does do a really good job in most cases. Um, take a look at the contact accuracy video a little bit later for talking about restitution coefficients and things like that um, because that can be relevant here if things start falling apart or being too flexible. But I'm going to show you how to do it individually. So if I come in and edit the feature on this mate, this one is a really straightforward mate. The faces where it's connecting are the faces I selected for the mate. And so if I come into the Analysis tab, there's this option that says Mate Location. That's actually where you can say where the mate is touching on each part. Luckily, in this case, the mate is touching the same face that I've picked, so I don't need to specify that. But let's say that you've got a component where it's you know some hexagonal um, uh, faces that are concentric to a, another hexagon, such as a wrench around a nut. The mate is going to be on some round face or round edge, but the actual mate location is those six hexagonal faces. So that's where the, the force is going to be translated. That works really well when you're exporting it to FEA so that you can get accurate representation of where that force is going to be. Same with load-bearing faces. Friction, we can specify friction in there, and that will, uh, for a dynamic analysis, that will allow us to see you know, what will happen with uh, friction slowing down that joint. And the last one is this bushing, and this is the one we want to look at. You're basically saying this has some amount of flexibility to it, and that is very similar to contact. So it's going to mesh the parts and it's going to say whenever they kind of interact with each other, intersect with each other, and kind of push through each other, we're going to push back a certain amount. And so by adding those redundant or those uh, bushings, we're able to potentially get a more accurate result. And in this case, we actually get <laughs> zero force on one and negative 10 on the other. So putting that bushing in actually kind of ruined it because we only put in one. If we go ahead and say replace redundant mates with bushings on all of them, we're going to end up with something that is much closer to what we'd expect to see an accurate representation. So there on the left you see a quick settling and then after settling we end up with a negative 2 and a negative 8 which still gives us our force balance but when we start to look at the actual reaction moments, the picture becomes a little more complicated. Looking at a free body diagram, you can see there's a contact point where it actually is going to apply a counter load. That contact point is countered on the other side. You also are going to see some torsional rigidity uh, through the off axis in the bushings. And what it ends up being is, is quite a mess. This interaction is a rigid interaction that causes deformation in the part that really can only be accurately studied in simulation. We can do the force balances. We can understand the loads. There are ways where we can get wildly wrong results, or there are ways that we can get results that are maybe just misleading.
So this file set is actually uh, a bit of a difficult one to do and almost an impossible one to study this phenomenon, but it does a better job of sort of illustrating what you might find in the real world. Be very skeptical about your results. Do fee free body diagrams. Check your work in simulation and FEA when needed. And just make sure that it all makes sense. In this case, I couldn't get it all to add up, so I had to go to simulation to get the full results. And those results are here. And it's a much more complicated result than simply forces on pins. Hopefully that was helpful. We'll see you in the next video.